Thanks, Dror. Uh, so just like the last time, uh, this talk will be an application of what Dror would have lectured on. Uh, it's an application of L2 techniques. OK? Uh, so, so here is one very trivial question. If I give you a bunch of points in C and a bunch of complex numbers, find a whole, an entire function so that this happens. Okay, so this is trivial, right? You just choose a polynomial of a large enough degree. If you want to jack it up further, I can give you countably many points, a sequence, and I can give you a sequence of complex numbers and ask you the same question. Now it's not clear, right? In fact, this question I posed does not always have a solution for very silly reasons. In that, for example, if, you ha if your sequence has a, an accumulation point, uh, say Zn, suppose it has an accumulation point, simply take, uh, uh, s simply take these complex numbers to be, say, zeros, at, at one point, make it non-zero, and at all the other points, just make them zeros, and the zeros can't have an accumulation point, right, if there's an entire function. And I'm just saying that if you can't, if you have an entire function and you have a sequence, the, the zeros cannot have an accumulation point unless this is a constant equal to zero. Sorry, didn't put it clearly. Anyway, there is a very trivial obstruction to this problem in that uh, Zn should not have an accumulation point. Yeah? But bear in mind that this does not prohibit the existence of a sequence like this, for example. say Z3, Z5 gets a little closer, Z6, in the sense that you can have a union of two sequences, and they both run off to infinity, but the distance, I mean, there is no uniform separation between the points, yeah? So, all right, and this is a sufficient condition, right? Because we have the Weierstrass uh, theorem that produces functions with specified zeros, and we have, I don't know who did what, we have the metag leffler theorem that specifies a, a function that has a, a specified principal part. It has poles at places you want, and the poles behave the way you want. Just multiply these two, roughly speaking, and you can solve this problem, okay? So this can be done. This is classical, so to say Weierstrass plus metag leffler Okay. Yes. 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 Thanks. No, no. That, that's right. Thanks. Thanks. So, so the point is, if you give me a sequence of points, regardless of what complex numbers you want to put at that sequence, I should be able to interpolate. Yeah, thank you. So uh, a different version of this question, which is the to topic that I'm going to study in this talk, is the following. You have the same thing. I'll first state this a little uh, vaguely. If a n have finite energy, whatever this means, is there an entire function f having finite energy such that f of zi equals ai? Okay, so this is a vague version of a question that I want to study. So Whatever finite energy means, now it's no longer obvious, right? I mean, we can solve this problem by using this technique, but 
you have to really go through the proof and maybe see if, if this technique gives you better some estimates, right? So that's not clear. So first of all, what does finite energy mean? So a more precise version of this question is the following. Finite energy means Sorry, I won't call these AI from now onwards. I'll call them F sub I, F sub N. Right. This finite energy here means the following. I see. Oh, really? I see. That's. All right. Yeah. So, by the way, if I don't put this, I claim this question doesn't make sense. It's not a, I mean, I didn't do it just because I wanted to be nasty. I want to be, but that's besides the point. This question by itself does not make sense. The reason is the following, that if you write down the Cauchy integral formula, let's say, instance this, it's not hard to see, and I urge you to try to prove this, that this thing is controlled by the L2 norm of this. So what happens? Well, if this is the case, this is going to be a bounded entire function, right? And that we know what it, we know what those things are, right? So this question by itself does not make any sense. This does. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so this question does, and there are non-trivial functions satisfying this requirement. Just take any polynomial, for example, right? Okay, uh, so this is the question we want to solve. Uh, so this is the problem of interpolation. And mind you, this is not just a natural question in its own right. I believe uh, it arose in the context of applied mathematics in information theory. Some other version, some other question, not exactly this, but somewhat related, was studied by Shannon. And it, was, it also arose in quantum field theory of sorts. Where Yeah. Sorry, what the so the notion of finite energy is not uh, necessarily just equal to Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. Sorry, maybe your point is maybe I should have yeah. put this. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay, so it ar it arises from some physics and electrical engineering based questions. Uh basically Okay, let me just give you a quick uh, reason why this is useful, not some questions like this. The point is, in electrical engineering, you're typically given a signal, right? Uh, say, a radio frequency. I mean, uh, let's say you, you, you get in, uh, data from a radio, you get, a, you get an electrical signal, and what you can do is you know the values of that electrical signal at a bunch of discrete points, 
and you want to reconstruct it. So there are two questions here. One is, can you uniquely reconstruct the signal? That's one thing. And is there a signal that reconstructs? It? These are two different questions, right? One of them is, is a uniqueness question. The other is an existence question. What we are interested in is the, is the existence question. Okay, this is the problem of interpolation, L2 interpolation. There is a corresponding problem called L2 sampling, which is the uniqueness question. Okay. All right. So if we want to solve this problem, yes? Yeah. Uh, so I don't exactly know what bearing it has on information theory, but in quantum field theory, things that satisfy this sort of condition are very common. They, they come up in optics, like if you take a laser, normally its wave function satisfies these sorts of things, okay? Yeah. is about the nature of the set of nodes. Mm. Here we are provided pairs. So are you saying that the problem? No, that's why I didn't want to put this uh, despite uh, the what? energy is associated more specific uh, on the domain side. Yes. Yeah, you're given this. This you're not changing. You're only allowed to change these things, but not any arbitrary sequence, one that satisfies this. Now, of course, this thing does depend on this thing. But uh, I'm suppressing that. No, no, no. Even there, you're, you're told what ZIs are. You just have to reconstruct the Fs from there. We have a machine taking samples along this sample. All right. So here, this is not good enough, okay? It's of course a necessary condition, but this is not good enough, right? What can go wrong here? See, the problem is, suppose I have a bunch of points, all right? Suppose they get very close to each other. They, they, there is no accumulation point, but they get very close to each other. What can go wrong is, you see, he, from, let's say I have the value of my function here is one, and here it's zero. The, the entire function has very little room to jump from one to zero, right? So its derivative in this region is going to be huge. Whereas the sequence can be anything you want, as long as it satisfies this. The entire function has very little room, so the derivative could be large. And as we shall see in a moment, this sort of a condition implies that the derivative cannot be too large, okay? I'm being very vague here. I'll just make it precise in a moment, okay? So this can not always be solved. That's the first thing. So what are necessary and sufficient conditions on ZI so that every FI satisfying this can be interpolated? Okay, that's the question. So this question can be sort of strengthened or weakened depending on how you look at it uh, to the following equivalent question. Maybe I'll just say, this is equivalent to the following thing. So first of all, there is a partially defined, uh, let me, so let me call this, oops, this is entire functions f, such that okay, I'm defining two Hilbert spaces. This is sequences Fi such that this is the case. Okay, uh, this, this sequence I'm calling this by this symbol, okay? 
All right. Firstly, you have a partially defined map from here to here. Namely, simply the restriction map. Namely, f of z goes to the sequence f of zi. This is not necessarily defined on the entire Hilbert space, right? How do you know that just because something is square integrable, if you restrict it, it's square summable, right? So you have a partially defined map. The point is, you have some sort of a, an inverse to this. Suppose, so, uh, Assume that this is interpolating. Okay. That is, to every f i in this second Hilbert space, let's call this 2, let's call this 1, there exists an f such that this restriction equals this, right? Suppose this is the case, notice that you can go the other way around in, in, the, in the following manner. You take f and send it to the minimal L2 interpolant, meaning you have potentially several th functions that do the, solve this interpolation problem. So take the one that has the least energy, right? All right. It turns out, and I leave these as exercises, it turns out that this map is linear, and using the closed graph theorem, you can prove that it is bounded. So the bottom line is, I want to say that this question, maybe I'll put this here. This question is equivalent to asking the following potentially stronger question. Is there an F so that this happens? And is less than C times this square, OK, for some C, independent of F. So this is a stronger question, right? Not only do you want the interpolant to have finite energy, its energy should be controlled by that of the original sequence, OK? These two are equivalent. That's the point of that little argument that I have not completely given. Uh, but the closed graph theorem shows this. Okay, so, so far, so this is the question. So the, the, the good thing about this question is we know everything there is to know about it, right? This question was studied, I don't know when, 80s or 70s, 90s, 91, okay, fine. So this was studied in 91, uh, so I don't, so, I know one big player here, that's SAIP. I believe a, a version of this was studied by a Swedish mathematician. This is, yeah, he did the Hardy's. Bowling, Berling, okay. All right, so SAIP's theorem is the following, that uh, the L2 interpolation problem Rather, that's not the way to say it. A sequence gamma is interpolating, that is, every f can be extended if and only if and has density less than 1, that is, low density. So what do these terms mean? So uniformly separated means that there exists a delta such that, as you can imagine, this is the case for all i and j, okay? This is definitely not the same as saying that they don't have an accumulation point. It's much stronger than that, 
Okay? And as I said, the rough idea as to why this ought to be the case is because uh, if, if, they're, if they're not uniformly separated, you can find examples of sequences that jump very quickly, but the, the entire function doesn't have too much room, so its derivative will be too large. And it will contradict this bound. Okay, that's the rough idea. Let me make it more precise uh, in a moment. But let me state what this means. So this is, so this quantity is the following. Uh, it's lim soup of R goes to infinity, the supremum over Z of divided by, is it pi R squared? It's just R squared. It's less than. So what this is saying is the following. So you are supposed to think of this as a lattice more than a sequence, okay? Gamma is supposed to look like this in the complex plane, right? So if I take a point Z and I take a disk of radius R, I count the number of points, there are four in this case, and divide it by R square, and I, I take the largest value of this over all such balls of radius r, and then I take this limb soup as r goes to infinity. Okay, so I take a, roughly what this means is if there exists a huge ball such that the number of points in that ball is controlled, okay, regardless of where it's centered, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not using the ordering of the sequence in defining this, right? I'm just taking a. Uh, because the number of i. Yeah. So. So yeah. So so roughly, why do you expect this sort of a thing? See, in real life, if you have too much data and you want to fit a signal to it, that's too hard, right? You don't want too much data. So that's the intuition behind this. For instance, in the corresponding sampling problem, you need to have enough data to be able to reconstruct it uniquely. Right? This is the opposite, where you should not have too much data. Okay? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, for example, if, if the gamma is, say, a lattice that is a square lattice, then it's yeah. trivially true, for instance. So it's not. Sure. I mean, that's right. He, he asked whether you can check it or not. Uh, sorry, you're right. It, that depends on the separation distance. But you can check it, for example, for concrete lattices. No, no, it's significant. For example, sampling requires a, some version of this to be larger than one strictly. Some version in the sense you get infs here, not soups. All right. So uh, unfortunately, the proof of necessity of this is, has a very different flavor from the rest of the things we'll be looking at in the stock, so I'll omit this. This, on the other hand, is very much uh, related to what, what is discussed uh, in this set of lectures. So one is necessary. Okay, so why is it necessary? Uh, so what we'll do is suppose that's not the case. Suppose uh, there, is, there is no such delta. In other words, there exists a subsequence, which I'm still calling like this, just abusing notation, so that 
Oops. What am I calling this? Sorry. Uh, I didn't give this any notation. All right, so this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay? So suppose this is the case. We'll pr produce an example of a, a sequence of complex numbers that cannot be interpolated. Okay? And the example, it's quite intuitive. As I said, basically what you want is uh, a sequence of sequences that violates that bound. So let, let me just define this. Define for each n a sequence. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to really abuse notation, but the question is how to correctly abuse it. Um, yeah, how to efficiently abuse notation. I'm so sorry, I'm going to do it this way. Okay. Uh, what this means is Fn of 1 corresponds to the point Z1, Fn of 2 corresponds to the point Z2, and so on. Okay. So, the sequence of sequences is as follows. Define it to satisfy this. I hope the notation is clear. What I'm saying is, ah, yes. Maybe I'll just, yeah. <laughs> All right. That, that's true, but it's a little jarring. So what I'm saying is that you have a bunch of things that get very close, right? So we want to contradict by saying that if, if you jump a lot between these two, there's a problem, right? So you want to come up with a sequence that is zero everywhere, and it is one exactly, roughly speaking, not one, some non-zero thing exactly at one point. And the place where it is non-zero, you keep moving it further and further away to get a bunch of sequences. Okay? That will produce a contradiction. So if claim there exists no corresponding sequence Fn, for all n such that Fn interpolates F n and satisfies this. So we will prove that this is not possible. Okay? So this is what we will prove. Uh, so the idea is as follows. So as I said, first I need to make precise this claim that some derivative is the derivative of a holomorphic function, very roughly speaking, is controlled by its L2 norm. So how does one make sense of this? Once again, if you take the Cauchy integral formula, You, of course, have this. From this, it's not too hard to show that this is controlled by the L2 norm of this on a ball of radius r, for instance. In other words, if your holomorphic function is controlled in L2 in a ball of radius r, for instance, the, at the center of the ball, the derivative is controlled. I mean, you would have seen some version of this in an elementary complex analysis course, where if the function is itself controlled, as in not the L2 norm, if mod f is controlled, then this is true, right? This is trivial. You need a little bit more to get the L2 thing, but it's a simple Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. 
So this is true for holomorphic functions. Unfortunately, what we want for this is not exactly this. It's all right. So uh, uh, let's see. Say something like minus This is 1 minus 0, of course. And this is supposedly Fn of Zn. Oh, damn it. Sorry. But this you can write by the fundamental theorem of calculus as Fn of what? I leave it to you to figure it out. Please think about this. Okay. Now, whatever this is, this is controlled by the supremum in a ball of radius, say, 1 of the derivative times Zn minus Zn plus 1. So what I'm saying is, this value is supposed to be 1, and it is controlled by the supremum of the derivative of this times the separation between these two points. Suppose I prove this is controlled, then this goes to 0, and that's a contradiction. right? Note that this goes to 0. And the point, the fact that, sorry, mod f square e raised to minus z square. So the problem boils down to showing that is controlled by a constant c. independent of n. So the way one shows this, it's very similar to this. What is the difference between this and this? Why are we not already done? Because this is not the mod square of a holomorphic function. Right? That's the problem. So how does one get rid of this problem? It's a very nice trick. You write this as z minus zn plus zn square. So it's this plus this plus twice the real part of this. What's the advantage of writing it like this? It is this plus twice the real part of some holomorphic function. This is holomorphic. And what about this? This is very pleasant. The reason it's pleasant is this is controlled by 1 on this set. So the bottom line here is, despite this not being holomorphic, in the region of interest, up to a bounded factor, it is the real part of a holomorphic function. Okay. So in other words, this is up to a bounded factor the mod square of a holomorphic function, to which you can apply the standard estimate. That's the rough idea. Okay. So all right, so this is necessary. So as you can imagine, the difficult part is proving it's actually sufficient, these two conditions. So to do this, we need, we don't need, there are ways to go around this. So how do you construct 
a holomorphic function. How do you extend stuff? You have seen the Osawa Takegoshi extension theorem. But we have seen in my earlier talk that you can use Hermander's theorem also. You can use Hermander's technique solving a d-bar equation to solve this problem also. But mind you, it's not straightforward. It's not as straightforward as it was in my previous talk. It requires a little bit of ingenuity. So we will directly use the Osawa Takegoshi extension theorem as a black box, a version of it. I don't think Osawa and Takegoshi originally stated it this way. Uh, this is the Euclidean metric. Let T be an entire function, function, and let lambda be a smooth function such that mod t square e raised to minus lambda is less than 1. Let z be equal to t inverse 0 be a submanifold. And phi a smooth function such that there exists a constant delta satisfying this. Then for every holomorphic function from f of z to c satisfying this, there exists an entire function extending this and satisfies this. This is, I'll write it as dA and dV, just to be suggestive. Okay, so the Osawa Takegoshi extension theorem says that you can extend from certain subsets satisfying L2 estimates. It almost seems to solve this problem, right? More or less, this is roughly what we want, right? So can we see, does it directly solve this problem? If so, then we wouldn't have necessary and sufficient conditions, right? So clearly, something needs to be checked here. So what, cho so first of all, this is in CN. In our case, it's just C. T be an entire function and Z is the zero locus of T. Is that the case in our situation? Notice that these Zn's are uniformly separated. In particular, they don't have an accumulation point. So by the Weierstrass theorem, there exists, there exists such an entire function. Okay, so that gamma is T inverse of zero for some entire function T. Uh, I'm lying a little bit here. It should not be any old entire function. It should be one that vanishes to multiplicity one at those points, okay? So if I take such a thing, there exists such a thing. What is our phi? Our phi has to be mod z squared. So this is trivial. This is fine. What we need to check is whether this is true. What is lambda? Yeah. So what is this lambda, and why is this true? Moreover, notice that this is not the condition that we have. See, you have a denominator here. There is no corresponding denominator here, right? So we need to check a bunch of things. What happens to this denominator, what this lambda is, and why this is satisfied, right? So this lambda, that, yeah? Uh, I mean, this is this is all we need. I mean, you can you can get a stronger thing. Yes, the Osawa Takagoshi theorem says something stronger, but we don't care. Okay. Right. So, how does one come up with such a lambda? Right. This sort of somehow gives us a clue as to what to do here. So we define lambda to be the 
area, if you wish. So maybe I'll write it as pi r square. Where is this? Lambda sub r to be of z to be natural log mod t square times the Euclidean metric. Okay. Oh, sorry. Right, right. First of all, del del part is one over pi. That's just by r square. It's yeah. Okay. Right. So we want to define this lambda to be so. The reason is. If you take e raised to lambda and take mod t square, this is the average of log mod square, right? The claim is this is less than 1. Why? Uh, so at least if t is not 0 anywhere, right? then this, this is going to be a harmonic function. So the average will be equal to the value at the center. So this is going to be equal to 1. If t can be 0, it can at, at most be 1 because it's a subharmonic. So have you word, used these words? Subharmonic? Yeah, OK. So this is a subharmonic function. OK, so that's why this follows. All right. So. So we have all the candidates in place. We just have to check that they do the, what they're supposed to, namely these two. right? And as you can very well imagine, this is going to correspond to the density being less than 1. This is going to correspond to uniform separation. Okay. So uh, this should be a little shady. Why is this shady? This. This theorem, if I want to use this lambda, I should, I should find this a little suspicious. I'm not supposed to use this lambda, at least strictly going by the statement of that theorem. The reason is lambda is not smooth. This is not smooth. Okay. So, Technically speaking, you're not supposed to use this theorem to this, but let us pretend that we can do so anyway. There's a, way, there's a fix to this, but uh, we'll see. We have time or not to discuss that. So pretend that lambda, this choice, is valid, despite not being smooth. Okay. So we need to compute del del bar of lambda r. So that's. Uh, del del bar, OK, sorry. I'll change my variables so that this becomes 0 r. This is w plus z. And so this is del del bar of this. Let's pretend I can take the del del bar inside. And you get something like this, OK? What should this be? That's the question, right? If this is a non-zero thing, then this is simply ln of a holomorphic thing plus ln of an anti-holomorphic thing. Del del bar, the del bar kills this and del kills that, right? So you should naively think that this is zero, but it's not. For instance, even if you take del del bar log mod z square, this is not zero, right? I mean, if you integrate it over a small ball centered around the origin, whatever this means. If I take, for example, this and take a epsilon going to 0, this is not going to be 0. Okay. Uh, let me write down this and let's hope, let's pretend that we understand what this means. Up to a factor, maybe I'm missing a pi here. Is it a pi? I over 2 pi. I over 2 pi. Thanks. It's the Dirac delta. Okay. 
So what this means is, this is not quite zero. It's supposed to be infinity at the origin in a very controlled manner, in the sense that if I take any smooth function with compact support, and I do this, if I integrate by parts, I'm supposed to get this to be equal to the value of it at the origin. Okay, so this is a distribution, right? So in any case, because of some fancy words, there is a way to get around this. As I said, you can t put a plus epsilon square and so on and so forth, but it's a little annoying. So the, the bottom line here is that this is simply the density. I'm hope, I hope I'm not missing any factors of pi's and so on, but That's true, uh, but, but yeah, even, yeah, basically it boils down to this, but okay. So anyway, the bottom line is, what is this in our case? It's simply just the usual thing. What is this? This is the density, more or less. So what is this saying? That the density better be strictly less than one. Okay? I may have messed up a couple of factors here and there, but this is what is supposed to happen. Okay? So the density being less than one translates into the positivity of curvature in this language. This one follows from uniform flatness. Claim uniform, sorry, uniform separation. Uniform separation implies that this denominator is larger than for all z. So the claim is uniform separation implies that this is bounded below. So the Osawa Takegoshi extension theorem as a black box gives us the result. Okay? So how does one prove that? Right. Notice that this should be this appears to be a little suspicious, right? This t here is not unique. You can have lots of t's defining the same set. You simply multiply it by e raised to a holomorphic function, you get a new t, right? You can verify that this expression here is independent of what t you choose, in the sense that you take your favorite t, multiply it by a non-zero entire function, this expression is going to be the same thing, okay? So that is another reason for the choice of this seemingly strange weight. So, uh, let's do this. So, in a ball of radius r, okay? So if you want to prove this, this thing involves an average over a ball of radius r, yeah? Centered at zi, okay? So in a ball of radius r, there could be other z's, right? There could be other points in the lattice. And all those points are problematic. Why are they problematic? Because they are points where the integrand becomes problematic, right? So you can imagine that all of these points are going to play a role here. So T in this ball, in this ball, looks like some uh, non-zero holomorphic function times the product of all the Z minus Zj's where Zj belongs to this ball, right? These are all the Zj's, etc. Okay. So T up to a non-zero factor 
is simply the product of a bunch of standard things, right? If you substitute this in this expression, uh, if you substitute that, the claim is, you uh, please verify this. As I said, first of all, of ZI, oops, add ZI, E raised to minus the average of the product of this, these things. Okay. The first thing is you can get rid of this non-zero factor. Please check why. This one is simply going to be the product of zi minus zj square times e raised to this business, right? By uniform separation, these things are all bounded below by some positive number. I leave it to you to check that this is also bounded below. You can explicitly integrate it if you wish. So this is why this is bounded below. Okay. So in other words, the density condition should be thought of as giving you positivity of curvature. Uniform separation is translating the Osawa Takegoshi norm into the norm that you want. Okay. All right. In the last few minutes, just keep this as it is. So suppose you want to generalize this question to higher dimensions. Okay, what's the correct generalization? Okay. So the correct generalization is, what is the equivalent of a point in C in higher dimensions? Well, the Osawa Takegoshi theorem tells us what to do. What we should be looking at is we should be extending from sub-manifolds of dimension n minus 1, right? So, given an entire function t, c n to c, let z be t inverse of 0, and f be a holomorphic function on z, such that mod f square e raised to minus mod z square is less than infinity on the induced metric over z, then there exists, it is, does there exist? It's a question. Yeah, so I'll just come to that question in a moment. Yeah. So does there exist f such that f restricted to z is f, and this is the case. So okay, so first of all, there could be many versions of this question. Let us first assume that t va vanishes to multiplicity to order 1. That is the first thing. But even then, this question is somewhat different from that. Why? Because in higher dimensions, you can have singularities, right? For example, if you take y squared as x cubed in C2, this has a cusp. It's not a submanifold, right? So in that case, how does one make sense of this question? Well, f, can, f is defined to be a holomorphic function on a singular object. If it is the restriction of a holomorphic function from a neighborhood of this object. Okay, that's the definition. But that is one subtlety. Let us assume that we don't have such problems. Let's say this is a sub-manifold. Even then, this question is very different from that, and a result like SAPES is not yet known. Okay? So the, the tricky parts are the following. You obviously need a version of the density condition, and you need a version of uniform separation. We don't know any necessary conditions. Mind you, there is no necessary con whatever, however you define these, it's not clear that they're necessary, okay? 
We won't even bother with seeing whether this sort of a thing is necessary. Okay, one can define this so that this property holds for that particular weight. Okay, the real point is how does one define a version of uniform separation? So one way to think of uniform separation in higher dimensions is the the let's say in C two you have a curve. Morally speaking, this sort of a thing is not uniformly separated, right? However, you want to think of it. What uniformly separated should mean is that there should be a uniform sized neighborhood around it. And it should not be any old neighborhood. It should be a neighborhood such that every point here has a unique closest point here. Okay? So the analog of uniform separation, one possible guess for it is that the surface is uniformly flat, meaning there is a uniform size tubular neighborhood around it. What's an example of something that is uniformly flat? Well, for example, this is one example, y equals x squared in C2. More generally, if I take y equals a polynomial in C2, the graph of this is going to be uniformly flat. Morally, you should think of it as algebraic things should not curve around too much. Roughly, this is what you would expect, right? So these are examples of things that are uniformly flat. And Draw and I, actually, even before us, this particular version was studied by Draw, uh, Ortega, Sert, and I think Schuster. So maybe I won't write the full theorem, just state it here. If the density condition is met and uniform flatness holds, then this can be done, and this is due to Varolin, Schuster, and Ortega said. Okay? I'll just finish by just one small remark. There are very innocent looking algebraic things that are not uniformly flat. This is not uniformly flat because it's a bunch of parabolae, and the parabolae in some sense get thinner and thinner, right? So anyway, we, we worked on these things, Draw and I, but um, this is still a wide open area. There are lots of things not known. Stop here.